Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Pearce, and I am one of the directors um, here at SCN2A Australia. And we thank you for joining us and being interested in this webinar on Prax 562, which is a new treatment um, that is going into clinical trial for both SCN2A and SCN8A. Um, with us today, we have Dr. David Cunnington, who is a specialist sleep physician um, with postgraduate studies in clinical epidemiology, epidemiology um, and pharmacoeconomics. Um, and he's done a lot of, has a lot of experience in clinical trials and working with government to get um, treatments approved here in Australia. Uh, so we thank you for being our host today, David. Um, he is also one of our directors here as well. And then presenting uh, to us today is Brian Fisker, who is the Vice President of Global Medical Affairs at Praxis Medical, uh, at Praxis Precision Medicines. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Brian. But if you've got any questions, please drop them in the chat or we'll have opportunity to do so at the end of uh, the presentation. And with that, I'll hand over to Brian. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, so my background, as, as you mentioned, VP of medical, I've been doing this for 25 years, both in drug development and medical affairs. Um, but kind of the thing that a lot of people don't know, or people on this call may, uh, my son has epilepsy. And so this is something that is, you know, beyond scientifically simulating for me, it's really hits home. Like some of the things we've gone through, some of the things that we've experienced, and just having been part of drug development for so long, it, it really is exciting for me to be here. You can't see the goosebumps on the Zoom, which is good, but it's exciting for me to be here because we're really at this next level of, of change that we can have in, within uh, epilepsy. We can really do a lot better. And one of the things we do at, at Praxis is we talk about solving for time, right? Because we want to do this faster. We want to look at, at how long does it take to develop a drug? How do we go quicker? And we wanna look at, at how do we get treatments to patients quicker? How do we make lives better quicker? So really we're solving for time. Well, it, it's kind of wrapped around the, the guise of, of science and we want to solve for epilepsy, but realistically it's time that we're working against here. So um, again, I appreciate the, the time that you've given us today and, and I'll go ahead and jump into some of the, the material that I have to share with you. So hopefully I do this properly. I've got two screens, so it hopefully will show the proper one. So it looks like we're in good shape. So um, just to give you a quick update where we are, so Praxis Epilepsy, we have a number of programs going on, but I really wanted to talk to you about the one that affects your community the most, the SCN2A community. And so uh, thanks for being here today on, in some places it's June 7th already, some places June 6th. So I appreciate the late nights and the early mornings um, to, to join us today. So really wanted to kick this off with what we're doing in the US. So this is the information where we are with, with Prax 562. I'll tell you what it is here in a second, but it's, it's you know, our, our molecule that we're looking at for SCN2A and 8A, as Chris had mentioned, we have a clinical trial up and running currently in the US. We have a site that is in Tacoma, Washington. There's pre-screener information that the patients in uh, the US, if they're interested in finding out more about it, they go to emboldstudy.com and they can get information regarding what the inclusion criteria are and some of the, the information there. Um, we've designed this, the study in a way to help cover travel. If patients are traveling, uh, we have MD group in Praxis are picking up the tab on that to be able to get patients into um, the, the centers. And then again, just this is kind of highlighting where oh, I'll put my pointer on. This highlights what this is, Prax 562222 is the study drug and the number of the study. It's a small molecule for gain of function SCN2A and 8A patients. So what is it? So, so people always kind of like, what is Prax 562 aside from an abbreviation and some numbers? The reality is, it, as I mentioned, it's our lead molecule for SCN2A and 8A. But what it also is, is it's different than what we've seen in the past. And so the reason I say it's different is having worked on other sodium channel drugs in the past that have been sodium channel blockers, this drug is really designed to, to inhibit sodium current in a way that's different than what we've seen from standard of care. And so then the next question is how? How does, how does it work? How is it actually doing this? And so I always kind of joke, it's a great question and I have an even better answer for it. So when we look at the mechanism of action. How does it work? Where is it having its, its force? Where is it exerting its benefit? 
Um, I always like to start with sodium channel states. So you can see here on this side of the graph, we have sodium channel states and we have a closed channel, which means the sodium that's outside of the, the channel can't go in and can't trigger neuronal activity or firing. We have an open state, which is where the sodium is able to freely pass through and create the, the neuronal activation. And then we have an inactivation state. So these are the normal channel, normal states of the channel. So you have opening, closing, inactivation. And, and that's typically the way that, that you and I function for the most part. What we see is within SCN2A, for example, there's a pathological variant. So there's a variation in the gene that causes this channel to not really act the same way, not, not as a normal channel would. So you have the sodium able to pass through in this persistent current. So if you kind of look at this, it really never goes through this inactivation. So this little tail never closes off in this channel. And so what that means is this, it's, it's kind of almost like a, a leaky faucet. The, the you know, sodium is able to pass through the membrane, pass through into the channel and trigger the activity. And what the activity tends to be is seizure. So what you have is you have this hyperexcitability, you have this pathological variant that is creating this hyperexcitability in this channel. And what we want to do clinically is we want to address this channel, but we want to leave these alone. So the normal channels, which are open and closing and inactivating as they should, we don't really want to block those channels. And so old school drugs, old school sodium channel blockers would block all of this. It would be across the board. So it would work on this on this pathological mutation as well or the, in this variant, but it would also work in these normal channels. And so that's typically where you would see the side effects. So the balancing act that we have clinically and scientifically is how do we slow this current, this persistent current from going through this channel and triggering these seizures at relatively low thresholds without really affecting these too much because this is where you'll see your side effect profile. And so what we've noted is in SCN2A and in 8A as well, one of the, the main causes is this pathological persistent current. It's kind of a mouthful to say, but, but the reality is it's this current flowing through that's triggering that seizure that we want to slow, but not the rest of it. So what we've designed, what we've done is we've designed 562 specifically to really have the, the protective benefit against the seizure causing activity but we want to minimize the blocking of these. And so that's what we, we are seeing every step along the way with clinical development, we're seeing this, this potential benefit. And what this will translate to and what we believe this will end up telling us is that we can go to much higher doses of our Prax562 than what you typically could with a sodium channel blocker because the sodium channel blockers all block these. We're really focused on this. So this kind of, the reason that this becomes a concern is when we talk about persistent current, as I showed you on the last slide, when we study the sodium channels and we study it within DEEs, so that would be the SCN2A and 8A specifically, when we study this, we really want to do our homework to understand these channels, how they're functioning, how they're working, what the, the pathological uh, variant looks like and, and what the mutation may look like. What we're trying to do here is then to say what drugs are going to set up best to have the best likelihood of, of benefit for the patients. And so what we see is, is we look at things like NAV, or NAV um, 1.6. So this is a voltage 1.6. This is sodium voltage 1.2 and 1.1. So these are all ones that we focus on. In SCN2A, NAV 1.2 is an issue. In SCN8A, NAV 1.6 is an issue. And so what we see is, is as the patients you know, progress and mature, then it, it shifts areas from you know, different locations within the, the neuron itself. So what we want to do is we want to understand first and foremost that the variants do change the way that the persistent current presents. So we do see that this is a, a, an issue. So um, it helps us design molecules which would specifically address the needs of those patients. And so what we see with ours is because we do address both NAV 1.2 and 1.6, this is why clinically it sets up to be beneficial for both the 2A and 8A populations. What this looks like, and going back to the idea, so these are cells with an SCN2A variant and they have increased persistent sodium current. So this is, we see wild type in the black and then we see an R1882Q variant here in the, the fuchsia or pink. And so what we notice is that there are differences with regard to the persistent current. And this is what is contributing in a lot of ways to the seizure activities. So this does 
establish what was on the previous slide, showing that the variant has a determination of, of severity or determinant of the persistent current and the, the functionality of the patient. So this is important for us because then we look at this and go back to the idea of, you know, does 562 hold promise in 2A and 8A? And again, this, this shows us that um, it does, that the, the persistent current is an issue within a 2A population. And then we have the opportunity to address the persistent current head on, as opposed to doing it um, down, the, down the road, if you will, with some of the other sodium channel blockers. So how do we know? So one of the things that, that I love about Praxis is we're evidence-based. We look at the evidence to make our decisions, and we look at those, how to structure our programs, how to develop molecules. So, so what's, what's the evidence? What helps me to believe with great confidence that we'll have a benefit or potential benefit in this patient population? So we look at this and we start out first, the drug is, is different. I know there's, there's lots of you know, designs here on the, the screen, and I know not everybody's a medicinal chemist, totally understand, but what we want to start out with is the molecule, which is down here, this is PRAX562, is designed differently than what we've seen with drugs like lamotrigine, oxcarbazepine, sinobamate. And so having worked on some of these drugs in the past, they're good drugs, we can do better. And that's where we are really trying to push this forward. So when you look at, at these structures, these little, almost look like little honeycombs, if you will, these little hexagonal structures, these are our benzene rings. And we see those present here in lamotrigine, oxcarbazepine, the synovimate. And so what we've seen in these type of drugs, where we, we tend to have to have a long titration period. So that means we can't start you out immediately at what a therapeutic level would be. So these are typically the drugs that'll take some time to, to dose up, you'll increase incrementally. With our molecule, we don't have the same structures. So what we're seeing immediately you know, in, in our data is that we're not requiring titration. So this means we can start at a therapeutic level and we're not having to go through a 10 to 12 week titration period to get you to a, a therapeutic level. So this is immediately, you know, creates, you know, interest in, in me scientifically to say, okay, how is it, how is this the case? We look at the structures, we see it's designed differently and we expect it holistically to function differently. And so one of the things to look at is a lot of times people ask, what is it? What is, what is PRAX562? I always like to say what it's not. And so when you look at this molecule here in the blue, this is carbamate. And so anytime you see drugs with the name carb or mate, they tend to be a derivative of carbamate. So it makes sense. So a lot of times these are improvements from the parent molecule, but they're still going to have the same challenges and same issues that the parent molecule has. Incrementally moving forward, we, with PRAX562, it's a holistically different molecule, so it's not a variation of lamotrigine, and it's not a variation of carbamate, so it's a holistically new molecule um, in this epilepsy space, so we're incredibly excited. Um, again, the data have been indicating to us that, that we do have something different here, and that we do have something potentially beneficial within this patient population. So I always like to show the data, because again, I'm like, data-driven, I wanna see the data. I'm sure the audience wants to see the data too. So when we look at, at what we're trying to do, what we've seen historically with sodium channel drugs is you tend to, to, if you think about it like a plane taking off, you tend to run out of runway before you can get the plane into the air. So what I mean is if you think about it from a seizure standpoint, we tend to run out of ability to increase the dose of the drug because of side effects and tolerability before we get the seizures completely under control. And so that's why you'll see patients on multiple drugs, multiple sodium channel drugs, because you just run out of ceiling. You, you hit, hit up right up against onto the, the side effect tolerability issues. So what we're looking at doing is creating a drug, which is, is really two things, you know, much more potent and has, you know, multiple, you know, seizure um, controlling properties. And so this means the persistent current. But it also then is, is working on disease state dependence. So looking at, at only working on the, you know, the area that, that needs to have the attention, if you will, only controlling the sodium in those pathological areas. And then looking at also, um, you know, how do we get to the point where we have control of the seizures in the long run? So the data show us looking at lamotrigine and carbamazepine, for example, the amount of drug, and this is concentration across the bottom, the amount of drug that they have to give to get to inhibition of 60%, for example, is here. So you're like at, at uh, 100 micromole. You look at that compared to PRAX for the same amount, PRAX 562, to get to the 60% control, 
you're looking at, at you know one one hundredth of that amount. So if you're looking at at a hundred, you're looking at, here's one, here's point one. So you're looking at at much much smaller amounts with the potency. You know this is really your potency uh, calculation. Drug is significantly more potent than what we've seen before, which allows us to dose in much smaller amounts. And then also it gives us the opportunity if we can avoid the, the side effect, you know, tolerability issue, then you'll have a, a bit of a longer runway, if you will, going back to the old analogy. And so um, what we see is, is realistically, it, 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 it exhibits the enhanced preference for persistent sodium that we're, we're really driving at, as I had shown in the previous slides. So when you look at this, and I'll show it a different way because the other the slide's a little bit more telling. We have carbamazepine, sinobamate, and lamotrigine, and those are the ones I had shown you on the, the structural slide. When you look at those, you have a very similar concentration curves. So if you're looking at how much you know drug has to be delivered to get to this inhibition point, again, just randomly picking 60 because it's a good visual, you can see where the doses are on the X and Y axis compared to the inhibition. And so this shows us that, that we can get there with less drug initially. And we show that the ratio of persistent current select, or, um, selectivity or you know, preference, if you will, is, is much better than what we see with these other ones. So meaning we can get to the area that matters and we can and deliver the drug and we can really focus on that target that we have in mind based upon the, the background of, of the sodium channel uh, mutations that we see. So I'm excited about this because, again, the biggest issue had been you run out of you run out of drug, you know, dosing before you can run out of you know the, the seizures. And I think that we have a much better opportunity moving forward with these new molecules. The other thing I think it's important to note, and this is interesting, um, Prax 562 is starting out studying in pediatrics, so we have orphan drug designation you know, for severe epilepsy, pediatric epilepsy from FDA and EMA. Um, it has, in my past, we've always developed them in adults and moved backwards. Um, but again, solving for time, understanding the importance of, of getting better molecules and better drugs into the hands of patients and families, um, we're solving for time in the pediatric space. So what we've seen is looking at, I showed you the, the preclinical data, I showed you, you know, kind of the tolerability, you know, piece that, that is beginning to set up. In the studies that we've done with healthy human volunteers, so these are our, our subjects who come into the trial who don't have sodium channel you know, mutations or variants, who have normal functioning channels like you and I, when the drug, when 562 was dosed alone by itself as a monotherapy, um, we didn't see serious side effects. And, and we also didn't hit this, this main um, goal of, of a maximum tolerated dose, meaning that they still could have gone higher. So this is incredibly, encouraging for me because typically you would see in a very susceptible population like like healthy humans that don't have abnormal uh, sodium channel function, you would see a lot of side effects if you were blocking everything. So back to the idea of are we blocking persistent current? Are we you know controlling the persistent current? The answer would be you know yes based on preclinical and then based on this human um, exposure. And we've had about 132 patients, I think, at the last look that have been 132 rather uh, healthy volunteers who have been exposed to Prax 562 with, with similar outcomes. So it's an, exciting for me because if you were to see major, major issues, this, the susceptibility of seeing that in the healthy volunteer would be higher because they don't have the hyperactive sodium channel like what we see with the 2A and 8A kiddos. The other thing we have too is 562 is liquid formulation. So my son, we're still on liquid formulation. He's 10. Um, you know, I have not switched to an oral formulation, like an oral tablet, because I like the liquid, because I can drop what I need and dose how I need. So I like that. So 562 has its liquid formulation once daily. And what I didn't mention in, on the last slide is Prax 562 is designed with a half-life or ends up with a half-life of three to four days. So that means this is going to be once daily dosing. So once the drug is on board, once it's in the system, it'll be there. So a lot of drugs that are dosed twice a day. So my my dosing here is BID. Um, that means twice a day. Those drugs have shorter half lives, which means if you miss a dose, then it's going to go back to incredibly low blood levels. So a three to four day half half life here means that if you were to miss a dose for whatever reason, 
it's not automatically going to go back to an incredibly low blood level. You should still have a, a fair bit of the, the drug in your system because it would take about you know, three to four days for half of that dose to be gone. That's what half-life means is it takes about three to four days for, for half of that drug to be gone out of your system. So this is, I think, again, for me, for peace of mind, and it, it's a really nice benefit um, to have a longer drug that stays on board. Once it's on board, you know, it should stay on board, you know, in, in the patient and it should you continue to do what it needs to do with it being state dependent. It's going to work when it needs to work and it's going to work on the persistent current. So it's really designed in a way to, to do things that other sodium channel blockers have not done. They've typically been short half-life. They are, are very, you know, across the board blocking everything. This one gives, you know, more flexibility um, to allow the normal channels to function, which ultimately should result in, in better outcomes. And in Prax 562, this was incredibly important as well. It's both keto friendly and able to be administered through a G tube or a J tube. Um, because when we looked at, we've done some publications and look back at the data on this to really understand, you know, how, you know, when you're living with 2A and living with 8A, you know, what are the challenges that you're running into? And so then if we can continue to knock down the hurdles and again, solve for time and solve for you know, the, the issues at hand. You know, can we create better medications just by understanding populations, understanding the, the background of the conditions better? And, and I do believe we can, and I believe that's what we're seeing right here is with this information. It's really strong, you know, signal that, that, that we are creating things that, that would make lives better in the long run. So in order to get to that point, in order to get this, you know, through to the next phases, um, I want to highlight what we're doing in, in uh, 562221. So that's the clinical trial, um, because there's some kind of, again, cool points that I've seen, haven't seen this in 25 years, some cool things that we've been able to implement and, and do that are vastly different than what clinical trials in the olden days were. And I can say olden days because I'm definitely a relic of the olden days. So by us being able to, to capitalize on this and move forward and help the families, I think this is huge. So one of the things to think about is we historically we've talked about patient centric focus. And, and so it's a, a term, it's, it's exciting to talk about. It's, it's really interesting to look into what we've done here in our practice. And I think is different than what we've done other places is we've listened. We've listened to community. We've listened to, to thought leaders. We've listened to physicians. We've listened to treaters. And, and we take that information and we understand and we really now have taken that understanding to elevate it to a different action on our end. So I'll, I'll show you what that means. It, it, for us, for, in order to, to move things and to solve for time, we want to move as, as quick as possible and even quicker than that. And so what that means is we need to design trials that we can do with smaller patient numbers. So we don't, you know, we can go quicker in that regard. We want to have durations of study. So in this case, we back to the patient numbers, we have 20 patients that we need you know, in this particular phase of the, the study development, we need 16 weeks of, of treatment exposure. What we're doing here in, in, is different than what I've seen historically is we're limiting the amount of placebo that patients would get. So instead of having two parallel arms, one placebo, one active, we're doing two parallel arms, one active, and one with placebo for only four weeks. So instead of having a duration of, of 16 weeks, there's only four weeks of, of placebo. And, and we're doing this to um, create the rigor, the clinical rigor to give us that signal and to give us that, that guidance to move forward quickly into the next phases of development. So phase three, this is a phase two. So we move as quick as possible into the phase three. Um, so that means creating formulations which are are you know good for the G tube because this allows different populations to be included. Because if you only have an oil tablet, you wouldn't be able to get every single patient. So looking at G tube friendly, keto friendly, um, looking at clinic visits, reducing the number and travel burden for patients and caregivers, it's incredibly important to us. So these are the things that, that we heard, we understood, and now we're taking action on. Um, even then looking at, at state-of-the-art seizure detection measurement at home. So this is something that, that hasn't been done a lot in clinical trials. We're trying to look at, at ways to, again, do better and do better faster. And then at the end of the double blind, there's an open label extension. You know, if there is benefit for you know, the patients who have been on treatment, then there would be a, an open label extension that they could go into. So here's the study schema. Here's the design, because I think it's just important for people to see like, like what 
thought went into the development of these protocols. Um, there's a screening period, which will have a 28-day baseline observation period. And this is just to get where the baseline seizures are. So um, in our trial, they're required to have you know eight seizures per, per month. And so then we just confirm at baseline, what is the baseline count? And then they'll get randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to what I had mentioned before, 16 weeks of Prax562 or the 12 and four weeks of placebo uh, and 562. So again, um, majority of the time patients are being treated with active therapy, which is a huge win compared to what I've seen historically. Once they complete that, they'll have the option of going into uh, the 48 week open label period. And then they would be followed up at the end of that you know, with a four week. Or if they decide at the end of the clinical trial, hey, I'd like to do something else. There's another therapy that they're interested in, for example, you know, they would go into the safety follow, follow up their B4 week you know, period, and they would look at what the most appropriate treatment for the patient would be at that point in time with their clinician. So we're excited about the design because again, limiting placebo, increasing, you know, the, the, the rate at which we can get patients enrolled and looking at the, the time it takes to get them through and getting to that, that yes, no answer and getting to, you know, that, that how do we kick off the phase three part is important. But the other part was to come up with a double blind treatment period, which it was as, I guess, as, as easy. And I hate to say the term easy on the families as possible because it's always challenging to be in clinical trials. But we wanted to set it up so that there were options that they could either do, you know, the, the traditional, this would be the in-clinic and they would have visit at um, visit one in the clinic, then they would go back every month subsequent to that visit for an inpatient visit there. And then in between where we want to characterize, you know, how the drug is, is in the system of the, the family and the system of the patient, they would have blood draws and, and check on the patient every two weeks. So essentially, in this course of time, you would be seen every two weeks, um, either at home or you would be seen, you know, in the clinic. And so this was this was a significant step forward in allowing them to not have to be back into the clinic every two weeks to get blood draws and, and those type of things and follow ups. So this was a, a great step forward. One of the things, though, that we did is when we looked at the way that we could do the trial and we thought about this and took again that feedback we got from the, the community, the, what we heard, what the families told us, the experiences that we've, we've seen um, and what the clinicians had told us too, we said, is there a way to do something that nobody's ever done? And so what I'm getting to is we're doing now this, this decentralized clinical trial design. So what that means is you don't have to come to the clinic at all. So this is really, really something I've never seen. It, it took, this one totally gives me goosebumps, so I apologize. But this one is, is very exciting because we've never done it where the patients could be treated at home and seen at home and measurements done at home. But when we went back and, and heard the feedback and heard the community and heard the needs that were out there, we said, how do we do this? And so we have internal folks on the team here who have spent more hours than, than they like to account for there, but they've spent so much time trying to figure out how to do this. So we now have this opportunity so uh, to do decentralized clinical trial design. So the patients can be seen at their home. They can have blood drawn at home. They can have seizure um, EEGs done at home. They can have everything done in the comfort of their own home without having to come into the clinic. And so this has been like that monumental moment, talked about it for 25 years. I've never seen it happen until now. So I'm excited to do it, you know, especially for this population because we have seen that, that, you know, both 2A and 8A patients, you know, in families, it's harder for them to travel than what you might see with a focal epilepsy. And so to, to allow those patients to be part of something and allow the community to, to be part of something and to grow this is really what I think the, the decentralized clinical trial brings us. And, and again, looking at the quality of the molecule and, and what I think the molecule will be able to do, I think it's incredibly exciting, you know, on, on so many levels to be able to have this opportunity to do everything at home. But if they prefer, they can do it in the clinic, and this would be the clinic schedule where they can just do everything at home. And so one of the things that, that made this possible and helped us to be able to do this is we designed elements of the clinical trial that could be done and executed at home. So for example, I talk about the, the uh, seizure recognition system. So this is for nocturnal seizures. And so I just kind of joke, it's called Nelly, which I love the name, um, I look at the design and, and when people ask me to describe it without a picture, I say it kind of looks like a really bad Ikea lamp, but honestly, Ikea is a good product, so I don't mean anything negative towards them. 
But what it looks like is, is you can see the base and you can see this little arm and you can see then there's a camera at the end of this. And so this will sit over the, the, the subject's bed and will re record seizure activity throughout the night. So um, just an example, in my child where we picked up the seizure activity was at night. So this, this part really warms my heart to be able to see this. We had to go into the ENU though, right? So to, in order to do this, we had to hook him up. We had to put him into the, the EMU, so the epilepsy monitoring unit, ICU, all this stuff. It's, it's, it's kind of it's a little stressful, I'll have to, have to admit. So this kind of allows us and really um, gives us the opportunity to bring the EMU to you so we can deliver this and deliver innovation at the speed of life, which means we can do this in your house. We can do this in a way that you typically would not be able to do without these, these innovative ideas and without the you know opportunities saying, hey, let's 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 do it. Let's let's be nobody's done it before. And so that means there's no playbook to follow, but let's do it. So that the Nelly will look at seizures through the course of the night, will help us to understand are there you know other treatment effects that we're seeing that we aren't able to capture in a normal seizure diary that we're not noticing as as parents sleep. Um, we can you know move this device as needed. So my child doesn't always sleep in his bed, so it could go with him, pick it up and put it and place it where it needs to go. Um, allows for continuous observation through the evening. And what we've seen too is this creates an opportunity. Wearables can be difficult um, due to sensory processing issues. Some, you know, wearing a watch at night isn't easiest for everybody. And so then in this situation, you know, this would replace what you typically would have with a nocturnal seizure monitoring device as a wearable. This would be your video EEG or video um, seizure monitoring that then can be analyzed. So excited to do that because this then helps us to get one step closer to DCTs. So then we looked at that, we looked at the electronic diary. So this typical seizure diary that you would use in a clinical trial, we can do this remotely as well. So this primary endpoints being captured remotely absolutely sets up for us to, to move forward into a, a a decentralized trial design. And so um, mobile phone, they enter the information from the mobile phone, they're able to capture it in real time, they're able to upload it into the database, which, you know, again, helps us to solve for time. How do we do this faster? We do this faster by capturing data in, in non-traditional ways or ways that, that can expedite um, and, and really leverage technology to get to that next step more quickly. And then the patient services too. So if there's any issues, if, if patients were wanting to, to travel to the, the clinic, then we do set that up too, because it takes time to, to solve for, you know, how to get on the planes, where to go, how to do all those things. So any of these things that we can make easier, you know, this is what we've done in this, this novel design, you know, within our clinical trial process. And in the home health piece too. So again, being able to have nurses and clinicians go out to the the houses to be able to capture the medication, you know, logs capture, you know, any adverse events, any of those type of things is really creates an opportunity for us to, to bring the, the clinical trial to the family, as opposed to having the family come to the clinical trial. And this is, it, it's, again, I, I can't express how, you know, pleased and, and happy and, and proud of the Praxis team for being able to come up with these designs and, and implement these. And then we're looking at the EEGs as well. So when you look at a nice montage like this, and we've all probably seen these, probably seen way more of these than we ever wanted to in our lives, but we can capture these at home too. And we have these little caps that they'll be able to put on and capture the, the EEG at home without having to go into the clinic and having to go into the ICU or the EMU to do that. So this is really, you know, in, in a nutshell, highlights the innovative nature of what Praxis is doing all the way from the the drug and the molecule being used and the way it's functioning through then to the application of it. So this is kind of where we are right now. Um, like I mentioned, we're doing this in the US. We have a, a site open in the US. Um, we are expanding into Europe. So that's coming here in the very near future. Um, and we'll have more updates on that here shortly. Um, but Europe and also the decentralized design in Europe will be a, an option as well. So this creates you know, significant opportunities for families um, and, and again, helping us to move the, the medicine forward and move really better treatment outcomes forward. So just want to say thank you for everybody listening and, and uh, joining in today. And, uh, you know, definitely happy to entertain any questions that, that people might have. And so I'll stop sharing now, which is great because I didn't mess up the slides, you know, and, and I happened to show my email inbox. So that's a victory. 
So I'll stop sharing and we'll turn it back over to David. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian, for that. That's really helpful. Um, anyone like to ask any questions? So feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions of Brian. So Brian, I'll just ask a couple of things. So you talked about potentially the trial being open in Europe. Yep. You know, a lot of the those sort of innovative things that make it easy for families, those logistics might be easier in one country, but harder to coordinate across countries. How are you going to go in Europe with make that ease of access for families? Yeah, that's that's a great great question, and I think that's one of the things we've got. Uh, we've got people in different uh, areas of Europe right now who are helping us to solve those. So we we've got groups that are, you know, working in each of the countries to understand what the regulations are, to understand, you know, logistics, like you said, like like how if somebody's in Italy, how long is it going to take them to get there? How do we set them up? How do we uh, align all those things? We've got our our program team and our, our um, development team that they're working on this and recruitment team who are are exploring every one of these options. To make sure that there's any you know any information that that helps us to move this more quickly we're using the same group md health or md group rather who is is in the us helping us with the patient travel they'll be doing it in europe as well um and then you know working with each of the families to, to come up with a custom tailored solution for them to be able to travel appropriately yeah and anna's just put the question in the box in terms of timelines for Europe. So it sounds like the study design is going to be the same. So the same sort of protocol, yep. but yeah, anticipated timelines. So, so I always like, um, so sooner rather than later is, is kind of the, the first answer, but it's going to be, you know, we should be up and running, you know, in, in Spain within a couple of weeks at this point in time. I always, always kind of nervous to say exact dates because, you know, holidays get thrown in there, different things come up you know, IRB approvals come up, but but it's looking very promising, you know, that it should be here within a couple of weeks that we would be up and running, you know, in Spain. And then what about, you know, what's the, what's the definition of Europe? How far east does does Europe go? You know, that's that's a great question. I don't I don't think I have a good answer to that, to be honest. I could I could make up an answer, but I don't think that's gonna help us here. Um yeah. but we do look we do look at case by case basis. To see where they are and and a lot of it is because we look at the ema guidance they've issued on on decentralized trials and we look at then you know what country regulations are there and and you know travel visas as necessary and and uh so it's really been case by case basis and that's why it's important for us to have your know, contacts in the country who are able to help us sort through the regulations and understand you know those so that we don't either promise something we can't deliver or we don't make it more difficult for people so it, it's really case by case and, and Praxis has some other drugs in development. If someone participated in the 562 program, how does that, um, does it block them from participating in other drug programs or lock them out for a period of time? Yeah, so typically what you'll see is is in uh, in the protocols I've written in the past, there's always been an exclusion criteria of if you're on an investigational treatment. So for example, if it's a drug that's not approved by any of the regulatory agencies, you would have to wash out or you'd have to wean off of that drug um, for five half-lives or typically about 28 days, whichever comes first. So the longer the half-life, the longer it takes for the drug to leave the system, shorter half-life, shorter. So typically it's about, um, usually about 28 days is the, the ceiling of those or five half-lives if you had a really, really long acting one. So, but they, yeah. they could, yeah, they could. So if there was another treatment that came, you know, into development and they said, hey, this is really what I think would be better for my my child, um, you know, they it would not exclude them from the trial. But if they were concomitantly taking it, so taking that drug while they were trying to take the new medication, that would exclude them typically in the other protocol, yeah. just because they don't want to confound the data. So someone, if someone's in the open label extension, that's that 48 week period there's still the option to uh, withdraw from the trial during they that could. period? Yeah, because patients are, uh, at, at any time during the course of the trial, patients or families can withdraw from the, the clinical trial. So like, as much as I'd love to see you complete the trial, and as much as it helps you know our data to get to those conclusions, um, you absolutely have the freedom to withdraw from the trial for any reason at any point in time. And then sometimes in these clinical trial programs, when the open label extension ends, you know, a company will provide medication pending regulatory approval. Has there been discussion about that? 
Yeah, we always keep all uh, all those options on the table. I've seen it. I've seen it in my career a lot because you get in, especially when you have a robust response, and and the the better the drug works, then the more compelling the the discussion is. And so I've seen that where you would amend protocols to extend the open label extension for you know yeah, maybe every six months as you have more data coming in and you do analysis or you do a year extension. I, I've seen that. We had that um, in a number of programs historically. And this is phase two research you're talking about. Just give us the sort of idea about when sort of phase three might be coming along or sort of what what's beyond the embold study. We are, we are already thinking about that now. So we are looking at this and saying, you know, what, what would be the scenarios that come out of phase two? How does that guide us? And then how do we start looking at that right now and thinking about even like, you know, where, where would centers be? How quickly can we go? Because again, going back to the whole concept of solving for time, like that's, that's, we're like, okay, you have to think about it now. So the minute that you get kind of the boat in the water, if you will, you're thinking about, okay, loading up the next cargo ship. What do we do? How do we do this? How do we get things going as quickly as possible? So we're already actively thinking about that internally and having those discussions on our program teams to, to look at what phase three would look like. So um, it would enable us to, to go as fast as possible with the data from phase two to ensure we have the right design for phase three to expect this. Chris? Yeah, um, Brian, great talk. Um, it's, it is really um, exciting, the potential of this particular molecule um, as parents of a child who went, you know, cycled through many different drugs and is still on um, two. Um, you know, it, it, it has a lot of potential for um, both young children and adults uh, with SCN2A or 8A. Um, I just wanted to ask or challenge um, or will firstly commend um, practice on the innovative approach they've taken to this clinical trial. And I just wanted to um, ask or, you know, just, uh, pose the question to you of in in, in, in any realm, um, is there the possibility of like a global decentralised trial? You know, they, we have kids, um, you know, with rare diseases, uh, you know, all around the world and it's, it's, it's it, I guess it's disheartening when you know that it needs to start, it needs to start somewhere, but, you know, like is there um, a time where we can look at launching um global decentralized trials um yeah just a question and thought and um you know request <laughs> i guess um for you know for countries that don't have large numbers but still have the sick kids and and dying kids essentially so i i love i love the question for two reasons like, like again the time element like like i've seen i've been in rare disease i've been in development and so i've seen this where patients are excluded from trials strictly because they have the condition you're studying, right? So if you think about it, when you say that out loud for a minute, you're like, kids with, with 8A or 2A are excluded because they can't travel to the center. And like, but this is the this is the audience. These are the people who are absolutely in need, beyond the need we've ever seen before for medications, which are, are you know, much more effective, which are much more, you know, tolerable. And so, so that's why I think, you know, again, I, I love what Praxis has done. And I can't like say that loudly enough or, or more excitedly to do this when there's no play, but nobody knows how to do this. You know, there's no like, oh, follow this. Everybody does it the same way. Nobody's, so we're like, look, we're going to blaze that trail. We're going to figure it out. So then to your question, so the second part of your question, can we do this globally? I'm like, hell yeah, why not? Let's figure it out. Is, is it easy? It's not. And it's, uh, I, I won't mislead anybody there. It is not easy by any stretch of imagination. Is it possible? Why not? Yes, let's figure it out. Like, and let's take the time to sort it out. Let's take the time to talk to each other. Let's take the time to really think about how do we do it? And it comes down to how do you design trials with, with endpoints which are able to be captured at home? So, so we see some of the trials and I've been part of ones that like really super complex. And it's like, well, I can't do it at home. That's probably not going to work so well. You can't have, a certain aspects. So, so if we design the trials the right way, and we understand that we want to have this as a potential, you know, evolution, we want to you know, go into the patient's homes, help these kids where they are. Yeah, I think we can. I think we just have to be like bold enough, and and you have to say, let's let's do it, let's figure it out. And that's really what I think Praxis has done here. Is say, let's get after it, let's do it, you know, and and let's let's you know use time as as one of these motivating factors. We have to, as you mentioned, because because patients. Are, are expiring. Patients aren't, aren't making it without better treatments. And so we need to figure out how to 
we got to figure out how to do it. And that's what we're doing is we're figuring it out how to build the plane as we go, but we have a lot of experience and we have a lot of knowledge in that, that space, you know, as far as clinical trials and quality and clinical design to really be incredibly effective at what we're doing. Thank you. And Brian, if families are interested in participating in the trials, no matter where they are or globally, what should they do? So I think the best thing is going to be probably to, to work in through the um, patient advocacy groups, so groups like yours, to, to contact them. Because um, right now, like as I mentioned, the information I shared today was for like what's going on in the U.S. and what's expanding into Europe. And so I want to make sure that, that then, you know, everybody is able to be connected with the information. We can share additional pieces um, kind of outside of this, this forum here, but, but definitely contacting the patient organizations, um, you know, is, is probably the most effective. Yeah, and, and where the study's running. So in the US, is there a different point of contact? Yeah, so, so like in the US, for example, the patients who were in the, the US would go to emboldstudy.com and they would have information that could connect them in. And then there's a, a actually we have a, a triage nurse set up there who is independent. So they're not a Praxis employee and they're not a site employee, but there's somebody who can like, because you have like, there's a million questions and like a handful of answers. And so that, that triage nurse is there designed to say, well, how do I help you? How can we sort this out? And how then can we connect? So then as sites would come online, then they could connect you know, the patients to those uh, particular locations you know, to get them into the clinical trials appropriate. Uh, and for Europe? So for Europe, um, right now it's been contacting the, the site. So once the site is up and running, then that information will be shared and the, the families can reach out to the site and, and get working into that process um, and, and to iron those details out. Yep. Thank you very much. Any other questions that people want to pose before we close? No, and you guys are always, always happy to, any questions you have, I'm always happy to address and answer. And, you know, Chris knows how to, to get a hold of me. And so I can uh, definitely help out with anything. And then Ross, who was, he's off camera now, Ross is a phenomenal, phenomenal asset to the company. You know, he's, he's one of the, the greatest people to work with. So um, I can't definitely plug him enough on that to say, you know, Ross is wonderful at being able to connect us to who we need to be connected. So definitely um, happy to help. And, and I answer emails pretty much all hours of the day. So don't worry, I, I won't be offended if, if I get an email. So um, so just a uh, question, Brian. So as an exclusion criteria or in the run-in, do other sodium channel blocker medications have to stop? Yeah, so so looking at it, as I showed the potency curve and, and I showed them the other ones. So one of the things that we want to do is is in the monotherapy, when we studied this in healthy volunteers with only one sodium channel drug on board, the monotherapy, it was incredibly well tolerated. With the potency and the way that this works, the necessity to have two or three other sodium channel blockers plus this one doesn't seem to make sense. So the inclusion criteria would specify that the patient should be on no more than one sodium channel blocker. It can be on other anti-seizure medications, but only one sodium channel blocker, just based upon the potency and the, the area that this would work with the MOA. So just, yeah. So they could stay on one and add the Prax 562. Correct. Yep, that's correct. All right. Thank you very much. And, you know, I really, yeah. really want to commend, much like you've been talking about, you know, commend Praxis on the approach they're taking to clinical trials, because it really is a novel approach and really is different to how clinical trials are often done, which are often sort of patient unfriendly, if you oh, like. Totally. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm so, that's, that's one of the, the greatest, like, rewards I get by my job is to be able to do these things that, that nobody's done, to be able to, like, say, yeah, we can solve this. It's going to be hard, but we can solve it. And and how do we do it? And and how do we take that the you know leap of faith? And that comes from you know the leadership and really the DNA of the company is built on let's do it, let's get after it. And, and no isn't an answer, but we need to figure out how to how to get there. So yeah, it's incredibly fun to be here. Great. So thank you very much for the presentation, and thank you everyone for your participation in the meeting today.